Okay, I think we have children's church today, so kids, uh, you want to go to that, you can go. The rest of you, we've been through some uh, special times where we've gotten out of the book of Isaiah. Uh, today is uh, our time to go back to the book of Isaiah. And if you have your Bible, please turn to Isaiah 56, 6 through 12. Isaiah chapter 56, we're going to be looking at verses 6 through 12 this morning. We did the last one last time we were in Isaiah. And I'll get to that here in just a second. We stopped at what I think is a natural division for us, uh, for us to stop in the text. And we'll be picking that up today in Isaiah 56. First, however, I'd like to talk about uh, something that maybe get us thinking in a direction that I want us to go uh, eventually here. Um, I try to do a lot of my own mechanic work if I can. I do what I can to fix some things that are within my capabilities. If they're not or it's too cold outside and I don't have to, a way to get the car in the air enough, I take it in and have somebody fix it. And I, I do believe this, that when I take my car to somebody and have them fix it, let's say I go downtown here and and I have uh, my good friend Rob look over the front of my pickup and s check the bearings out and check things out. I just took it in to have it aligned. I can trust him because I know that as he's going through that stuff, if he finds anything out of order, if he finds a, you know, an inner or outer CV joint that isn't, isn't tight like it should be or a bearing that's bad or my brakes aren't good or anything, uh, he won't fix that without asking me, but he's going to tell me, look, um, this, this bearing is out, and we need to fix it for your safety. And I trust him to look it over. I trust him to do that. I trust him to care about me and my family and, and to say those things when I need somebody to be looking at that because I'm not there. And when you take your car to a mechanic, you, you I, I believe, would probably be thinking the same thing, that they're going to warn me of some impending danger or something that's going to go out on me when I don't need it to. And you trust him or her. Uh, for that because you don't want to break down out in the middle of nowhere, which I don't know where that is because we live in the middle of nowhere, but wherever you break down like that, and, and we want to know, you know, if there's something wrong. We trust these people that you don't just do the job and not look at anything else. You're going you're gonna to care about us. Now, in another area, when there is a soldier who stands watch or takes watch for his platoon or her platoon, I'm going to use the masculine here. I understand women are in the military, and I appreciate the, what they do. Uh, but anyway, uh, if, if you have a, a soldier and he's on watch at night for his platoon, he is required to watch. He is required not to fall asleep. He is required to be on his guard, to be listening, to be watching, and to take any clue that might come his way that there is danger about to be upon us. Well, what if he is tired that night or uh, when he's on watch? What if he's bored to death because nothing's going on? Or he just really doesn't care about the other soldiers who are sleeping while he's supposed to be watching? What if his attitude is, you know what, they're responsible for themselves and I don't really care what happens to them. I'm tired. I'm going to catch a few Zs. What kind of a mechanic would you like to have? One who cares or doesn't care about you? And what kind of a watchman would you like to have on watch while you are sleeping? Do you want the one who cares about you and the one that stays awake or is okay if he uh, gets a good night's sleep? I think all of us would choose the person that says, you know what, these people's lives are depending on me. I'm going to watch. I'm not going to fall asleep. I'm going to be awake no matter what it takes so that they can sleep without any danger overtaking them. Do you want your mechanic to be drunk while he is working on your car? Or would you rather that your mechanic is sober? Do you want your watchman uh, toking a joint all night? Uh, probably not. It may be fun. Maybe there's younger people here that don't even know what I just said. You hippie 70s types know exactly what I just said, right? Uh, do you want your, uh, your person doing that? No, you don't. Now I want to switch from talking about mechanics and soldiers to talking about pastors and elders. Let's say something about them for a second. I wonder what kind of one do you want? What do you want your pastor to be? What do you want your elders to be? What kind are you looking for? Do you want one that uh, can, and I'm sorry, do you want one, I'm sorry, i got to try this again. Do you want one no one can ever get a hold of or find? And what I mean by that is I've been called to the hospital before, and I know I'm not on call 
And I say, why'd you call me? He says, because we've tried five others or ten others, and nobody will answer their phone. You're the only one we could get. It's nice to know that you're on the bottom of the list anyway, but you're available. Do you, do you want a pastor that you can get a hold of? Or do you want one that really uh, cares about you and serves you because they believe they're serving Jesus when they serve you and they want to be faithful? Did you know that God has an opinion on how shepherds, we'll say that for pastors, on how shepherds shepherd, on how pastors pastor, on how elders lead? Did you know that God has an opinion on the kind of person that he wants in that position? God is very concerned about the work of his shepherds, we'll call them that, and about their attitudes while they're watching over the flock. We're going to say some more about that at the, at the latter end of our time together because the first part uh, is, is more about an ending on last time we were in Isaiah, and this is going to be about uh, what we're going to be saying later is about leadership, but we're going to start by talking and ending what we began last time about the kinds of people God wants to worship him. So that's going to be verses 6 through 8. We'll get to this other later. I I just had no way to introduce them both. Now, we want to look at verses 6 through 8, and that's going to be a little different than the rest of our passage this morning. And it really goes with what we did last time, a few weeks ago, when we were in Isaiah 56, 1 to 5. What the Lord was saying there is that God is looking for people who are willing to please him God is looking for people who are willing to be just and righteous and obey him. That's who he wants to worship. Then he adds this in verse 6. Also, the foreigners. Now, when God is talking about foreigners in the Old Testament, he's talking about those people that we would call Gentiles. All right, They're not Jewish people. Now, there were Gentiles who were proselytes to Judaism and followed Yahweh, but the the, the massive uh, Gentile community, the majority of them, had nothing to do at all with Yahweh, uh, Israel's God. It says in verse 6, also the foreigners, you could read Gentiles, who joined themselves to Yahweh, Yahweh is God's Hebrew name, to minister to him and to love the name of Yahweh, to be his servants, everyone who keeps from profaning the Sabbath and holds fast to my covenant. Even those I will bring to my holy mountain. And uh, what he's talking about there is Jerusalem, Mount Zion, Mount Moriah, all the same place. God's going to bring them to his holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be acceptable on my altar. For my house will be called a house of prayer for all peoples. The Lord God, who gathers the dispersed of Israel, declares, yet others I will gather to them and to those already gathered. He's talking about, I've already gathered Jewish people, and I'm going to add others to them, the foreigners, He's talking about the Gentiles, and as far as I know, everybody in here uh, would be a Gentile. What we learn in these verses is that Gentiles who love Jesus, and I'm using Jesus because even though this is in the Old Testament, this is in a messianic area of Isaiah where we're talking about the Messiah, and Jesus is the Messiah, and he's the one that this is all about. So I think I can say that. Gentiles who love Jesus will be welcomed into the temple of Christ to worship him. Now, having said that, what we're talking about is this has not happened yet. It's going to happen in the future. And what's going to happen in the future is that we're going to have the tribulation. And then after the rapture, we're going to have the tribulation. Then we're going to have the second coming of Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ at that point is going to gather all the unbelievers and put them to death. He's going to gather all the believers and he's going to get them into the millennial kingdom, which will last a thousand years where Jesus is ruling on planet earth in person physically he's going to be here for a thousand years and we will be with him and the people coming out of the tribulation in their earthly bodies will be with him and they will only be believers that enter in so what we're talking about is that in those days there will be a temple that is built and in that temple god wants people to know especially the jews although the jews are special to him You are going to be here worshiping, and you'll bring sacrifices and offerings, but I also want you to know that the Gentiles, the ones the Jews don't normally think of as being all that welcome at the temple, yeah, they can show up, but we'll talk in a minute about why they weren't all that welcome, and their worship is going to be as acceptable as as the Jewish worship is going to be. God is going to look at them as one. He's not going to make a division uh, between them. Now, I am convinced, as I just said, that this section like so many others in the book of Isaiah, 
is about a messianic eschatology. It's about the Messiah, Jesus Christ, and the, and the prophecies of the end times. Eschatology just means last things. The last things of the Bible that Jesus said are going to take place at the end of the age. So this is messianic. And he's talking about the millennial kingdom. And he's predicting what's going to happen in the worship in those days. What he is saying here about Gentile participation in the temple, which is where we will worship Jesus, has never happened to this point, and it's not happening now. So when you read a promise in the Bible, and you know it has never happened in the past, you know it's not happening now. We don't even have a temple in Israel, right? Uh, where the temple is supposed to be, the Dome of the Rock, the Islamic Dome of the Rock is there. And on the south end of uh, Herod's sandbox there is, is the Al-Aqsa Mosque. It's all Arab. There's no Jewish stuff going on on top. There would be a huge war if the Jews got up there and tried to do something. But when this is being talked about, there's a temple there. Jesus is there, and he wants people to know who can come and worship him and the kind of worshiper that Jesus is looking for. Remember, Jesus told a woman one day what kind of a worshiper he was looking for. Jesus said, I really don't care what sex you are, what race you are, what color you are. What I care about is, will you worship me in spirit and in truth? In other words, do you really belong to me? Have you made that decision to trust Jesus as your personal Savior, relying on his blood to cleanse you from your sins? That's, that's being in spirit. And in truth means, are you walking the walk? Are you doing what I told you to do? Are you obeying me? Jesus is looking for worshipers who truly belong to him spiritually. They've made that decision, and they're living out the truth. He's always been looking for those kinds of worshipers. At the temple in Christ's day, now what I'm saying there is, you know, we're talking about Christ the millennium, when Jesus walked on earth already, there was a temple, right? And Herod had built that temple. And that's where, that's where Jesus was when he went up to the temple to worship. In that day, in Christ's day, when a Gentile proselyte to Judaism would go up onto the temple mount, we call it Herod's sandbox because he had to level off the whole top of uh, Mount Moriah there of Zion, and he, and he built on, on level ground on top of that. We call it Herod's sandbox. In Jesus' day, you would walk up these big steps on the south side from the city of David into the temple, and you'd be up on the Temple Mount. Uh, Solomon's porch would go all the way around that. Uh, the Romans had uh, a place for their soldiers, let's say, in a fortress on the northwest side of that whole Temple Mount, but right in the middle was the Temple of the Lord God. That's where Jesus would go and worship three times a year. He was teaching in the portico of Solomon there all the time during the feast days. That's where Jesus would worship when he wasn't in a synagogue uh, when he was out going around in Israel. If you were a Gentile and you were to walk up those steps and you believed in Yahweh and that's where you wanted to worship, you would walk up those steps and then there would be this great big flat area. If it was, if it was time then for a festival, there would be people there selling doves and, and animals to sacrifice. These are the ones that Jesus turned over their money tables and said, this is not a, a house of commerce. It's a house of prayer. Get out of here. Do your business somewhere else. Jesus cleared that out a couple of times. But you would walk up there, and as a Gentile, you would walk towards the temple. Why? Because the presence of God is in the Holy of Holies, and you're going to pray to him. And you want to be as close to him as you can. But as a Gentile, you would see other people that were going through this little fence gate, and they would walk up to this thing called the beautiful gate, and they would go through that into the court of women. And then the men went through one other gate into the court of men, and they were right there next to the temple, the Jewish women were in the court of women. The next one's out. But then there's this big open area and a fence. And that's where you are. And the reason you don't get to go inside is because when you walk up to the fence, it says right on the fence, if you pass this barrier, we will kill you. Now, how does that make you feel uh, as far as being welcome to go and worship God? In those days, the Gentiles had to stay out. They had to be around that fence. That's as close as you could get. And I'm making a big deal out of that because as a Gentile, you wouldn't really feel that you were that welcome to come and worship God because everybody else gets to go closer, but you don't. And that's the way it was. There was this limitation set. And by the way, there were other reasons why a person was not allowed to go up to the temple and worship. I want to read some of those. There's, there's lots of different ones. Um, I chose this one in Deuteronomy 23. 
because there's some things we maybe wouldn't have thought about in there, but God made a rule in the Old Testament. Certain people are not allowed to come and worship at the temple. Now, that doesn't mean they couldn't be believers. doesn't mean they couldn't go to heaven when they die. But it says this, No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of Yahweh. No one who is of illegitimate birth shall ever enter the assembly of Yahweh. None of his descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall enter the assembly of Yahweh. No Ammonite or Moabite shall enter the assembly of Yahweh. None of their descendants, even to the tenth generation, shall ever enter the assembly of Yahweh, because they did not meet you with food and water on your way when you came out of Egypt. He goes on to list some more things like that. What God said was, anybody who was deformed in any way, you're not allowed to go up to the Temple Mount and worship me. Uh, and all kinds of other rules, if you had anything going wrong, because God was trying to teach them something by that. Well, if you're a Jew and you're thinking about the temple, you might think in Jesus' temple it would be the same way, and you'd be wrong. Generally, Jews held that Gentiles in the temple would profane it, make it unholy. Uh, though Solomon seems very clearly to invite Gentiles to come and pray there, in his prayer of dedication of the temple in 1 Kings 8, 41-43, he says, he says in his prayer, God, when everybody in the world finds out how great you are, when everybody in the world finally gets to see what you're doing for Israel and we're shining as a light for you, a lighthouse for salvation, the Gentiles are going to want to come here. And by the way, that was the whole reason God put Israel where he put them and gave them the laws that he gave them and blessed them the way he blessed them so that everybody would see what God was like and they would want a part of it. And just so you don't forget, God puts churches in communities so that those who don't know Jesus Christ would look at the church and they would say, wow, where do you get a God who is that wise and has that kind of a book that his people follow and obey and God blesses them and walks with them and helps them through their trials and tribulations? We need to go there and find out what he's like. We need to go there and follow that God. So... What I'm saying is this, and by the way, they failed miserably at it. How are we doing? Are we living our lives in such a way, are we walking with God in such a way that other people want to know Jesus because of us? Well, other people look at us and the way we're living, the way we walk with God and say, I don't know how they do that, but I'm going to find out. And when they ask you, you say, I thought you'd never ask. Let me tell you about Jesus and what he's done in my life. Now, it doesn't mean that we escape problems in life. Christians get cancer. It doesn't mean that we escape all the, all the turmoil in life. Christians go through problems. But we do it with Jesus, and it looks different than what the world is going through. At least it's supposed to. And when people at work see how you're living and how you control your mouth when nobody else does, how, how you come in and you pay a bill that they'd even forgot that you owed, or, or whatever else you do as a righteous individual, they say, wow, there's something different about her. There's something different about him. And I need that. I need to go find out what that's all about. And that's our evangelism. That's, that's why people should want to come and, and see what we're all about. Well, that's the way it was back then. And Solomon knew it. And he said, people are going to see that. They're going to want to come here. And God, he says, when they come, would you bless them when they pray? Would you hear their prayers when the Gentiles come? See, God never really wanted to exclude the Gentiles. That wasn't his doing. It was the prejudice of his people and his misunder their misunderstanding of God's heart. God will welcome anyone into his worship who meets the qualifications which have nothing to do with our race, our color, or our sex. God wants people to come and worship him in spirit and in truth. And it doesn't matter what they look like. It doesn't matter where they came from. God wants them to come and worship. In verse 6, any foreigner who severs ties with false gods and ties himself or herself to Yahweh as their only God will be welcomed by God into his holy mountain. He says, also for foreigners who join, and remember that word join is the same Hebrew word in verse 2 of chapter 56, and that word is used when a husband and a wife join themselves together. So this is, our joining ourselves to God is seen as an intimate thing, where, where we have an intimate relationship with God, and we really know him for who he is. And this person says, I give up my other gods, I'm going to solely join myself to the Lord God of Israel. And I'm going to minister to him. I'm going to serve him. I'm going to love the name of the Lord. And I'm going to be a servant for him. And I'm going to keep 
myself from going against the law of God. And that's the kind of person God is looking for. Here is what the joining of a Gentile to God looks like in verse 6. This person is ministering for the Lord. He loves his name. He serves him. He keeps the covenant that God made with Israel. He joins himself to that, and he holds fast to it. Now, Sabbath was a sign of the Old Testament covenant. Moses said, here's what you do to show you're a part of the Old Testament covenant. You keep Sabbath. I just want to remind you, uh, we have in the New Testament, all we, we have all of the Ten Commandments repeated for us except Sabbath. There is no Sabbath law for the church. That one was nullified. What we have are the other nine. They're all ratified. They're all brought straight across. But we don't have that one. Why? Because we are not under the Old Testament Mosaic Covenant. Why would we uh, be forcing ourselves to keep the sign of the covenant, the keeping of Sabbath, when we're not under that covenant? The sign of our covenant, the new covenant, is communion. And we celebrate communion once a month. And those who participate in taking communion should be those who have joined themselves to Jesus Christ through faith and they're taking communion and they're saying to the world, I belong to Jesus. I'm under the new covenant. This is the sign of that and that's what I'm going to keep. Well, in the Old Testament, they would keep the Sabbath. If you are willing to observe the Sabbath, you are serious about God. Today, if you're serious about the new covenant, you would be willing to take communion and follow the Lord in communion. And the other ordinance is you would get baptized as a believer and follow the Lord in baptism. If you were serious, it's a part of the covenant stipulations, it's a part of what we're supposed to do, so you would just do it, and you'd be willing to follow the Lord in that way. And those who get baptized and take communion are also servants of Christ. Minister to Him. Obey His commands. And they love the name of the Lord. Now, the way you, you, you're saved is through faith in Christ and His shed blood for you. Well, once you do that, then you're willing to be baptized. Then you're willing to take communion. Not for salvation. The Bible does not teach that. But because of your obedience and you want to identify with Jesus Christ. They do righteousness and justice. In verse 7, God Himself will bring them to the Temple Mount and He will cause them to be joyful in His house of prayer. He says it twice in this short little section. Notice that these Gentiles will also bring offerings and sacrifices to the temple. Uh, in the past, we only think of Jews that would be doing that, which wouldn't really be true because proselytes did. But we think mostly of Jews and mostly it was. But he says in those days in the kingdom, the Gentiles are going to bring sacrifices. They're going to make offerings and they will be completely acceptable before God. And I want to remind you that the Bible teaches in Jeremiah 33:18 and Ezekiel 44:10 that in the millennial kingdom, all those sacrifices can't save you. Sacrifices can't take away your sins unless it's the sacrifice of Christ. God is going to reinstitute the sacrificial system in the millennial kingdom. And the Jewish priests will be, will be performing sacrifices at that temple. Obviously, sacrifices don't save anyone. Hebrews 10.4 says it's impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. It was a matter of sanctification. It was a matter of saying, this is what God told me to do, and this is what I'm going to do. And you do it out of faith, and faith alone gives it its meaning. So in the, in the uh, millennial kingdom, there will be sacrifices again. The big deal is Gentiles are going to be standing in line with their sacrifices, and they are completely acceptable to Jesus. In the second part of verse 7, the house of the Lord will be referred to as a house of prayer, and it will be for all people, not just Jews. Think about what uh, is going on there. There's Jesus. He's going to be in the temple. You might be 150 feet away from him in the millennial kingdom. And he says, I want the world to come to this temple, and I want you to bow down, and I want you to pray, and I want you to talk to me. Yeah, well, that's strange. You're sitting right in there. Why don't I just walk up and talk to you in there? Why would I bow down out here with uh, maybe 100,000 other people and pray to you? Well, I think there's some reasons for that. This is where God wants you to go to pray. Why? Well, one thing is we don't want to cut the Father out of the process. Uh, we, we still pray to the Father in Jesus' name. And it puts us in a submissive posture before the King of Kings on our knees praying. And this is a place that was designed and meant for you to come and talk to God. And that, my friends, is the way it is, is now, and it will be. And it has always been important to Yahweh that you come into his house 
and you pray. So one of the reasons we don't let the kids run up and down the tops of the pews during the service and we're, we're not all talking and messing around is because this is a house of prayer. This is where we want to come and we want our prayers to be heard by God in the midst of the congregation along with other brothers and sisters in Christ. It's not the only place to pray, but it's a great place to pray. And I'm usually here by 7.15 or 7.30 every morning. I start my day in here praying for you every morning. And I love it in here. I love to walk around and pray for you. Some of you always sit in the same pew. You know, I know that when I'm when I'm in the in the front right corner, I would be praying for the Lamberts. That's where they always sit. Okay, and some of you mess me up and move around a little bit. That's okay, but I, but I pray for you here. It's a wonderful place to pray. You're welcome to come and pray here anytime you want. And it's nice to be in here by yourself, just you and God. And that's the way it was in the Old Testament days. That's a house of prayer. Um, he says to the world, come to my house and talk to me, and I will meet you there, and we'll pray together. There's something great about being in the presence of God. Now, you're in the presence of God at home when you pray. Don't get me wrong, but this is a, this is a special place. When at the end of the age, God slaughters all the unbelievers, which he promises he will do, he will then gather all the Gentile believers and the Jewish believers together, and he will take them into the kingdom, Matthew 24, 30 to 31. Now, at this point in the text, there's a shift of gears, all right? And from chapter 56, verse 9, through chapter 57, and verse 21, God is going to start talking about the current evil, wicked leadership in Isaiah's day. So these are people that are hanging around with Isaiah, the Jewish people, and God is going to say some things about their wicked leadership. We have to apply that to us. We have to apply that to us because God doesn't change. And what he felt about leaders back then, he feels about leadership today. And here's what it says. All you beasts of the field, all you beasts in the forest, come and eat. His watchmen are blind. All of them know nothing. All of them are mute dogs unable to bark. Dreamers lying down who love to sleep. And the dogs are greedy. They are not satisfied, and they are shepherds who have no understanding. They have all turned to their own way, each one to his unjust gain, to the last one. Come, they say, let us get wine, and let us drink heavily of strong drink, and tomorrow will be like today, only more so. So basically, you read that short little section. There's more to come about the leaders, but what you would come away from that, you would say, apparently... God's leadership spiritually in Israel at that time cared more about planning a better party tomorrow night than they had tonight, and they don't really care about warning people about what God says is true and what God says you need to be aware of. They really don't care about anybody but themselves. So we learn in 9 to 12 that those who have no regard for the Lord will be punished, especially here, the religious leaders of the day. In this chapter, the watchmen, probably the prophets, there was lots of false prophets in Isaiah's day, in Jeremiah's day, and every other godly prophet's day. And the shepherds could be the prophets, but also the priests, the pastors, if you will, even the king. And they're especially called out in this next section. In verse 9, Yahweh calls enemies that Israel suspects and enemies that they don't expect to come and feast on the punished of Israel. God is going to punish the leaders of Israel for not being the leaders he wants them to be, for being hypocrites, for being people that pretend to love the Lord but don't love the Lord. And God is going to bring punishment on them, and he's saying the carnage is going to be big enough that the beasts of the field and the beasts of the forest can come and they can eat their fill when God gets done with these. I believe this is probably also a messianic message when God destroys the unbelievers at the end of the age. They are about to be disciplined, and the metaphor brings death to mind. But why? Verse 10. God says, because the watchmen are not really watching. If you knew somebody was going to hell, would you warn them? If you know somebody didn't know about Jesus, didn't care about Jesus, and they were living a life that shows they don't, and they're headed for the precipice of hell, would you warn them? Would you say anything? Would you ever say to them at all would you mind if i care about you for a minute and about your eternal soul would you let me share what the bible says about how you can go to heaven when you die 
how you can know that? Or would you say, you know what, that's their problem. I got other things to do. Let them go. The watchmen are not really watching. They're not watching the condition of the people. They're not sounding the alarm. They're not telling them the truth of God. They just don't care. What is a watchman in Israel? Probably the prophets are in view. They're the ones that are supposed to be seeing the future as God gives them revelation and warning people, guess what's coming? It's what Isaiah did. He warned Israel that Assyria is going to come and wipe you off the planet if you don't change your ways before God. And he's going to warn Judah in the south. Nebuchadnezzar is going to come and carry you away, which he did in 605, 596, and 586 B.C. Assyria carries off the northern tribes in 722 B.C. And the whole thing is destroyed. And Isaiah could say, I told you. I warned you. But many other prophets, like one of Jeremiah's arch enemies, Hananiah, was saying, you know what? Jeremiah is lying to you. You can't trust what he's saying. The captivity is not going to be 70 years. It's only going to be two years. We're all going to be back here happy and joyful. And uh, Jeremiah said, you know, this guy's saying God said this. And Jeremiah says, well, may it be, but I don't, that's not what I've been saying. And as he walked away, God tells Jeremiah, go back to Hananiah and tell him he's a liar and that he's going to pay for it. And so Jeremiah goes back to Hananiah and says, the Spirit of God did not speak to you. You're making the people believe in a lie. And it's not going to be good to believe in a lie. But within the next few months, God struck Hananiah dead. That's what God thinks of, of watchmen who don't watch, who don't warn their people of the danger of, of disobeying God. Their job is to sound an alarm when threats are looming and tell people what they need to do in order to please God and live. They feared God more than man, and so they're willing to tell men what they need to hear instead of what they want to hear. They're unlike the Gentiles that we read about previously in verses 6 to 8. These guys do not love the name. They do not minister to God and serve him or hold fast to the covenant of God. Uh, Dr. Gary Smith said, they did not derive, I'm sorry, <clears throat> they did not derive satisfaction from serving God faithfully, from meeting the needs of others, or from the earthly things that God providentially provided for them and their families. They didn't care about God. Instead, they were blind to spiritual danger. I'm always impressed when I run into pastors who don't even believe there's a hell. That everybody gets to go to heaven. I don't know where you get that, but it's not in this book. And what good are you doing people if you lie to them and tell them you don't have to be concerned about what God thinks of your life? Well, you're a blind watchman is what you are. Even though these people appeared capable of the truth, but instead the Bible says they love to sleep, they were greedy, uh, which is not a good resume for a person who should be saving the eternal souls of other people with the message of God. The people perish where there is no one to sound the alarm. Alarms are all for a good reason for people. Ignore them to your own demise or your own detriment. See, if, if that little light comes on the car and says, you really ought to get this fixed and you don't get it fixed, you take it to the mechanic, he's going to put it on his scanner, it's going to say, the light came on, warned him, and they didn't obey the light. And so now he comes out and he says, guess what? Now it's going to really cost you. <laughs> you should have paid attention. Now it's going to really cost you because the alarm went off. You did nothing about it. And these guys did not warn of the spiritual dangers if you ignore God. Verse 11, and the shepherds, those who are supposed to pastor, those who are supposed to care about the hearts of the people that God sent them to minister to, are ignorant as well. They follow their own path in life instead of God's, not Yahweh's. You know, why, why would you follow a pastor who follows himself? You might as well follow yourself. <laughs> It'd be just as good. But if your pastor is following God, you better follow. Because we're following God. And that's going to lead us in the right direction. Every one of them, to the last man, was collecting unjust gain. They were in it for material wealth, as we've seen many pastors today in the ministry, to get out of it what they can get in their pockets from people like you. And they hoard it, and they're greedy, and they fleece the flock of God. These watchmen slept, and the shepherds fleeced the flock of God. You know what? I wonder if the shepherds of those days who spoke for God, because they had a pulpit somewhere in a synagogue, we called that the seat of Moses, or were they, were they aware at all that they were failing? Did they realize they weren't teaching the truth? 
Did they realize their people showed up to synagogue service or to the temple and didn't hear what God said? Did, were they aware of that? And I asked myself today, are there pastors who are aware of the fact you're not even teaching the truth of the Word of God? You're teaching, uh, you're teaching the, the philosophy of men? You're teaching all kinds of things that, that are from men and not from God? Do you even realize that? Do you understand what you're doing? Do you even care? I wonder if they cared at all. And I wonder about that because they were putting people's lives eternally in danger. If you don't hear the truth about what God has to say about salvation and your eternity, you don't stand a chance. And it's going to hurt. I wonder if they ever thought about the little children who came to synagogue service with their moms and their dads and trusted them. When little kids come into the sanctuary of the synagogue and, and you're teaching the word of, of God to them, do they even care about those little kids who come and think that the priest or the Levite is going to tell them the truth and tell them what they need to hear so they can be right with God? Do you even care about the little kids and what you're training them? And, and the truth is, what was going on in Israel with the religious leadership was that they were doing what Jesus accused the leadership of his day of doing, and that is you'll travel halfway around the world to get a proselyte to your brand of religion, and you'll make them twice the sons of hell that you are. Wow. And these priests and these Levites lead these little kids on a path away from Jesus and make them sons and daughters of Satan instead of sons and daughters of God because there's only two choices. There is no other. I wonder why shepherds don't care and watchmen don't watch when that's what God called you to do. Do they hate their ministry or the people who count on them for the truth? In verse 12, as if it weren't bad enough, we find out that their true motivation in life is to serve themselves, and their goal is that tomorrow night's drunken orgy surpasses the debauchery of the one we're going to have tonight. And let's get the booze rounded up so we can all get drunk. What a goal. Surely today the pastor should not participate or encourage such foolishness. I would think. People get drunk to escape the pain in their hearts. And then they find out the drunkenness is only temporary. The pain goes right on through. That's not the way you handle pain in your heart. Pity the people whose shepherd is a drunken, self-serving fool who really doesn't care about you. And I'm talking about your Sunday school teacher, your WANA leader, your pastor, your elders, anybody in leadership. Pity the people whose shepherd doesn't really care about them. You know, one reason that I don't drink, among many, is because when you call in my house or your parsonage with an emergency, I never want the reason that I don't show up to be that I'm too drunk to drive. Would you appreciate that? How would you like to call the house and say, you know, Noel is pastor there. We're at the emergency room. We've just had a wreck, and we need him. And she says, I'd love to send him, but he's been, you know, he's been drinking all night. And I'm not sure he's capable of getting down to the hospital to be with you. And you'd say, oh, that's okay. We know he likes to party. I don't think you would. See, things are rotten at the top in Israel. And I hate to say it, but in the majority of America, it's rotten at the top in America with religion and religious leaders. What must they be like for the average guy and gal in the country if the leadership isn't even living like they're supposed to live? God is so upset with this. Listen, this is going to get you back. Actually, Ben's preaching next week. Uh, I'll be back in two. But God is so upset with this that he's going to start putting the righteous to death in the next chapter. And you heard me right. God is so upset with what's going on in Israel, he's going to start putting the righteous men and women to death. You'll want to show up and find out why. I'm sure. What is certain is that the prophets and the shepherds in Israel deserve what they get. 
There is no righteousness and there is no justice. The leaders are too drunk to care and too busy planning their next party instead of how they can serve the Lord. I just want to ask you, because this has been about uh, you know, leadership, maybe you're not in that position, but what might be keeping you and me from being righteous and just? What's going on in your life right now that's keeping you from being righteous and just? Maybe you're too busy planning the next party. Boy, what some people live for and think is important. And by the way, what I'm talking about is themselves. <laughs> We're not supposed to be that important. God is. You're supposed to put him before you. And if you don't have a pastor that doesn't do that, you shouldn't have that pastor. By way of application, number one, have you joined yourself to God the way these Gentiles in this passage in the future are going to, going to join to him with devotion, commitment, service, and obedience? And do you see how that's what God wants from you? Secondly, do you see how much God wants you to talk to him? Do you understand that prayer is an act of fellowship, of submission, and caring about God and being cared for by God? You know what? You will spend time with and talk to the people that you like. Do you like God? Thirdly, take an inventory of your life. What is on the list of things you use in your life to cover the pain in your heart? What is your list of this is what I cover with? Uh, my first go-to thing is I'm going to get drunk. My next go-to thing is I'm going to get high. My next go-to thing is I'm going to go buy this for myself or I'm going to take a trip or I'm going to do what? What is on your list of taking your heart away from pain? Whatever it is, ignoring people, doing your own thing, whatever it is. Take an inventory of that. Why don't you get help for those things so you can handle it more in a godly manner that pleases the Lord instead of the drugs, the alcohol, the sex, the spending of money that I don't have always gone doing things that make me happy. And number four, don't grow weary of your service and devotion to God. Friends, it is worth serving Jesus Christ with all of your heart until your very last breath. Because look at the great things God has planned for those who love Him. And I want that to be us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we want to thank you that you lay out for us the good as well as the bad. You don't hide anything from us. And it is my prayer that we would not be fools, but that we would be wise men and women, and that what we see is to, is to be blessed by you so that we might experience what it means to walk with Jesus. And I ask it in your name, for your honor, for your glory, for your name's sake only. Amen.